the only conditions modern humans have ever known so far are changing and changing fast. It's tempting and understandable to ignore the evidence and carry on as usual or to be filled with gloom and doom. But there is also a vast potential for what we might do. Some of my colleagues think we are on the verge of something that could cause a profound change in that substrate, and that is machine superintelligence. AI godfather Alan Turing predicted that the default outcome is that the machines take control. The machines take control. I know this sounds like science fiction, but you know, having AI as smart as GPT-4 also sounded like science fiction not long ago. And if you think of AI, if you think of super intelligence in particular as just another technology, like electricity, you're probably not very worried. But you see, Turing thinks of superintelligence more like a new species. Fifty-six, my research had switched considerably so that I was mostly concerned with, with trying to write programs for computers that would simulate human thinking. You know, the question of why expert systems failed or became obsolete is actually a very interesting one. And there are, you know, if you uh, try to read the, you know, the historical perspectives, there are actually two lines of thoughts. One is that the, they were uh, essentially not up to the expectations. And so therefore they were replaced you know, uh, by, by other things. The basis of the web is fundamentally very simple. Browsing the web is enormously complicated. Oh, that's what's in it. People. The idea that any piece of information can have an address that so you can point to it is very simple. And really it all stems from that. In 1997, I was still the world champion when chess computers finally came of age. I was Mount Everest and Deep Blue reached the summit. Uh, I should say, of course, not that Deep Blue did it, but it's human creators. Anand Tharaman, Campbell, Horn, Sue, hats off to them. As always, Machine's triumph was a human triumph, something we tend to forget when humans are surpassed by our own creations. Artificial intelligence used to be about putting commands in a box. You would have human programmers that would painstakingly handcraft knowledge items you build up these expert systems, and they were kind of useful for some purposes, but they were very brittle, they, you couldn't scale them. Basically, you got out only what you put in. Since then, a paradigm shift has taken place in the field of artificial intelligence. Today, the action is really around machine learning. So rather than handcrafting knowledge representations and, and features, we create uh, algorithms that learn. When we first launched, we were hoping for, you know, maybe 400, 500 people. Harvard didn't have a Facebook, so that's the gap that we were trying to fill. Until recently, computers couldn't see, and they couldn't hear, uh, and, and this has begun to change. Um, so we now have, and since really just maybe five years or so, systems that can um, have vision in something resembling the way that we humans can see. So you can now have 
um, these deep learning systems that can look at the picture and uh, attach a caption of what it sees in this picture. There are obviously two massive revolutions in, in the uh, automobile industry. One is the transition to elect electrification, um, and then the other is autonomy. And yeah, it became obvious to me that in the future, any, any car that did not have autonomy uh, would be about as useful as a horse. So in the abstract, we always knew there would be some moment where for whatever reason, like the world would go from not getting it to getting it. And that all of a sudden it would be clear that this technology was working. Like internally, it at that point seemed very obvious to us uh, that language models were gonna keep scaling, they were gonna do all these useful things. AGI is basically the equivalent of a median human that you could hire as a coworker, and then they, they could say do anything that you'd be happy with a remote coworker doing just behind a computer, which includes, you know, learning how to go be a doctor, learning how to go be a very competent coder. There's a lot of stuff that a median human is capable of getting good at. There will come a point where no job is needed. You can have a job if you want to have a job for sort of personal satisfaction, but the AI will be able to do everything. The basic concept of the technological singularity is a point in time when technological advance occurs so rapidly that to the human mind it appears almost instantaneous. Yes. Like... Think about it. Machine intelligence is the last invention that humanity will ever need to make. The machines will then be better at inventing than we are. We've developed chemistry that goes into the pile of dust, into the pile of nanoparticles, and pulls out exactly the ones we need. So I think we want to do everything we can to make sure that Earth is going to be great for a long time, as long as possible, and would also allocate a small amount of resources, like I said, less than 1% of our economy, to uh, extending life beyond Earth. If Neuralink or something similar to that connects you to artificial general intelligence in your own mind at any given time, that's going to be the option that most people take. Breakthroughs in nanobot medicine and AI-driven drug discovery revolutionize healthcare, eradicating cancer and most genetic diseases. Humanity stands on the cusp of a new era where suffering and disease are no longer inevitabilities. Digital immortality becomes a reality as consciousness transcends the physical body to thrive in vast virtual ecosystems. The exit velocity of these charged particles, about a thousand times faster than in a chemical rocket, uh, moving at about 10% the speed of light. That means you can develop a rocket that would uh, propel something a thousand times faster than traditional chemical rockets. That means going to Mars in weeks, Pluto or outer solar system in months. A type two civilization has exhausted the power of their planet and they use the sun. They basically take the energy from their sun to power their machines. Then this type three, galactic, they roam the galactic space lanes. They play with black holes, sort of like the empire of Empire Strikes Back. And at that point, they would be type three. They would have the Planck energy to create universes or to move between universes. Perhaps in the swirl of transcendent expansions and infinite discoveries, the essence of our story lies not in conquering the cosmos, but in learning that every question births new frontiers, a 
and every answer evokes deeper wonder. We have become both the caretakers and the architects of countless worlds. Yet, in that final reflection, beneath all the swirling galaxies and shimmering universes, one truth remains. Our origins, humble, fragile and finite, forever illuminate the infinite canvases we create. In the end, this cosmic odyssey is less about arriving and more about the unending dance of becoming.